The scripture reading this morning is from Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. And there's just a little typo there. The sermon isn't called the message. Um, the translation I'm reading from is the message translation. So when you open your pew Bibles, you'll see familiar words. And I have a slightly different um, uh, version of what I'm reading. So let's pray before we hear God's word. God, we indeed come to this holy moment with all of ourselves, with everything in our mind, with all of our past, with our concerns of the future, all of it. We ask that you help us to set that all aside, that we would come into the presence of your word, that we would be changed by it. We know that it's alive by the power of your spirit. And so we come asking that you would take my words to proclaim your truth, because we come in Jesus' name, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Matthew 11, 28 through 30, listen, 30, listen people of God, to his living word to us this morning. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Come me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me. You'll learn to live freely and lightly. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What do you think of when I say dream team? Dream team, the image this morning. Right, you're putting together the very best, the very best of whatever the, the focus that you're working on is. And you get to hand pick, we're saying in this description, description, you get to hand pick exactly who that is. Who do you want to have on the team? There's also a sense of thinking through, assessing the range. You can't just have the best set of people if they don't complement each other in skills. And so it's the combination of skill, ability, and then the way to make that group work together to be a team. So you're recruiting first. You're choosing the very best. And then training to work together to make the team. That's the perfect combination. That's the image I want you to hold in your head. I realize it comes from the ba basketball team, right? 1992, something like that. That was the original dream team, but keep that in your mind. So two weeks ago, we looked at the familiar story of Jesus recruiting astonished fishermen to leave their nets and expertise and become fishers of people. Whenever Jesus went there, were, went, there were healing and barriers broken, and people looking at themselves and what was possible in a whole new way. We tend to think of those disciples, both the twelve and all the other followers, the women and men that aren't mentioned but who travel with Jesus, are changed by Jesus, as, as stock figures. Did you all grow up with, as I did, like flannel boards? You know, the Sunday school teacher had it out there. Maybe you read people in your family, um, the Sunday school kind of books. They're the stock figure standing there. But these were real people, actual people. They were uneducated fishermen. They were hated tax collectors. They were people who had been filled with what Scripture calls demons. We would think of as mental illnesses and so on and so on. Take, for instance, a story that happens, in the, that happens in the Gospel of Mark, right after the calling of those fishermen. They go into the synagogue together, and a person caught up in insanity starts yelling at Jesus. That could happen right here like this. They're in the middle of worship, and Jesus is teaching. And someone starts to yell out at him, at him, out of control. And Jesus speaks to him and heals him on the spot. And while we don't know what happens with that person next, he has to be totally changed. So maybe he follows along, or maybe he stays put and does a new thing. And as soon as they leave the synagogue, they enter Simon's house, Peter. Peter and Simon's mother-in-law is sick in bed with a fever. So Jesus came in, and he takes her hand, and he lifts her up. And then the fever left her, and scripture says, and she began to serve them. 
Now, my first reaction, I think, forgive me, men in the room, most women would say, well, of course. She was sick in bed and she's healed. She'll get up and make sandwiches for everybody, right? I mean, that does come to mind. I don't think that that's the point of the story, though. I think that since in that day, someone coming in and, and touching someone who's a woman, someone who was ill, and on the Sabbath, all of those taboos, that Jesus wasn't doing that, of course, to have her get up and make a casserole for them. What's actually going on there, I think, is a, a total sense of she felt of what was changed. It was different. It wasn't just simply like taking a Tylenol and not having a fever anymore. So Jesus starts his ministry with these stories, and then it continues on and on, saying, you can forget what you thought you knew about God. That's why I'm here in the flesh to show you. And so he continues, you see my metaphor, the weirdest recruiting trip ever. He has some smelly fishermen. He has someone who's been yelling out in mental illness in the synagogue who was healed, was healed. And now he has a sick old lady. We'll make her an old lady. We know that mothers-in-law are not old. But a sick old lady who he's healed. This is Jesus' dream team. Most of the characters only show up in a verse or two. We don't think about it that way. We get to hear one little line about healing, but we don't know the whole other chapters to the story. That's the wonderful thing about, we're going to call this person Linda. We're not going to call her the mother in law what her name was, we'll call her Linda. He reaches down and touches her, and she knows, as I said, that things are different now. And what I love, and what I love about the story, jokes aside about Linda, is that she knew what to do when her life was different. She knew what to do after she had the healing touch of God. She used her hands to serve. That was the response she used her hands to serve. She immediately became a son just received. Jesus healed her and restored her, so she stood up, and then she served someone else. It's an amazing act of grace. It's not obligation. Again and again, Jesus touches someone, and that touch heals them from mental illness or physical issues or physical issues or all the different things that he, he reached in and touched someone's life. But it's also a new identity. She saw herself differently. It's like she was, he was deputizing them, healing them, and then sending out the out to do something different. Because Jesus didn't just heal individual, individual sick people. Not just that. The gospel tells us that Jesus wants to restore all of humanity. And so every person that Jesus healed was conscripted, so to speak, into the kingdom of God and called and told to do likewise. That's why the next part of the story, in the evening, the people around the town around brought everyone to come and be healed. Everybody, the whole city, Mark's gospel says. Because there isn't really a separate category of people who are sick and well. Most of us hide our sicknesses pretty well, if we can. There isn't just people that are troubled emotionally, and those of us that are just, oh, we're just fine. I raise your hand, you're all just fine, thank you, we're perfect. But of course we're not. Of course there's sickness and trouble and all of that mixture in all of us. And trouble and all of that mixture in all of us. And so maybe Linda O'Connor sees a whole city worth of people coming toward her. And she simply transmits what's given to her. She gets up and serves. She's been deputized. And so think about it for a moment. I think she kind of just pushes up her sleeves and says, all right, I know what it's like to do this. I can do this. There's a whole group of people. Great. I'm going to go out and do it. Think about this for a moment. Jesus, God Almighty, could have picked anyone. That's what happened. He could have picked anyone, anywhere, to be his disciple. Anybody. And he starts out with fishermen or other people that he's healed. He has any possibility for a dream team, and he picks them. 
And today, he picks us. He picked us to be here. I mean, look around. Right? This is who he has to work with here. Now, we're a little more sophisticated, maybe, than fishermen. And most of us aren't shouting out in the middle of the worship service. We've got it under control. But we know. But we know each other well enough. We know our strengths and our weaknesses. We know our eccentric behavior and, and when we can be calm. But literally, if you believe in the providence of God, and we do, this is his dream team here. And when I thought about that and I pictured where, who might be here and where you were sitting, it makes me smile, doesn't it? Does it make you smile? This is what he wants to be here and how he wants us to work together. And so he assembled them and he assembled us. And you might think, oh, well, I chose to be here. Okay, we have free will. But scripture says that he loved us first. So enter into the image with me. We're the dream team here. So it's recruitment and then training. So I ask you to think, what works for you? How do you learn something? I would tell you I almost always have to see it to be able to do it. Do it. I can have someone read something to me or I can listen to something, but if I want to do something hands-on, I have to be hands-on. I have to be able to see it and touch it and do it or I don't have a, a chance of it working. Maybe for you, you took a course, or you had a lecture that was useful. Maybe you had a mentor. Maybe you were thrown into the deep end, whatever that was. Hopefully not in the deep end of the pool. But metaphorically speaking, thrown into the deep end, you're like, all right. I can learn how to do this the hard way. We all have different learning styles, and in different circumstances call out different techniques. But really, but really when we're learning how to do something like interacting with people or doing something so strange and wonderful as being the church, we have some trial and error. We have to do it hands on. And when we say trial and error, that sounds a little nicer than messing up, having a failure, failure and trying again. That's what we do. We try something new and maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, but we learn something and we keep trying. Jesus, with those followers, had three years with them. We have the power of the Holy Spirit to be taught. And Jesus wasn't, try wasn't trying to be an educator in the way um, that you might have been happy. Not that educated type. Maybe he didn't have a life with him. Maybe he did have a life with him. His mission was unwaveringly <clears throat> to set people free. To set them free of what they've been told about me. Focused. He had it planned out. He was relentless. Every move, every word, every step was intentional to show people what life could be like. Clearly, Jesus defined life in a whole different way, and the only way people could get a clue about that was to watch him do it. And get a clue about that was to watch him do it. And that's what we pray. We pray that God would give us his mind, his attitude loving people the way that he did. So he took a group of people and he traveled around the countryside. And he showed everyone, this is what it looks like to live free. This is what it looks like to know that you're loved. And he used that focus, mostly as we know, by telling stories. He would see a crowd of religious know-it-alls and he looked into their hearts and he told a story. He would start with, what's a time there was a man who owed a little, little bit of money. And then I imagine he would look over at the disciples like I would have Carol and say, get it? Get where I'm going with this? And smiled and went back to the story. Or maybe it was a story about a self-confident Pharisee or someone who was insecure. Jesus spent the bulk of his time how, how to live, not to follow certain rules. And he taught them on the move. I don't know how many um, religious movies you've seen with Jesus. You know, I mean, Christian movies. Usually he's sitting there around the table. He looks really good. Sometimes he's a little too blonde and blue-eyed, but he's sitting there around the table and talking to people, maybe at a meal. And he did that, of course. But I once saw this strange film that stuck with me that had him on the move, walking and talking over his shoulder while they were going forward. 
just like we do with our friends or with our children. Or friends or with our children. We're moving forward and saying, hey, look up here, hey, come with me. And some of the teaching had to have been like that. They were on the move and he was teaching them as they went. He took them on the road and he showed them, as I said, not just a set of rules, not don't react that way, but showed them how to live a life that reflected who God. It's true, if you were going to learn something, if you are in the middle of doing it, you're more motivated to learn it. If I said, all right, we're going to learn French, but we're never going to go to France, you might be, okay, I've got some time on my hands, I'll learn it, but you wouldn't be motivated. If I told you, or if I was told, a month from now we're going to be in France and we're going to be out in the countryside, want to learn some French? We would all be like, yeah, okay, I've got it. Want to learn some French? We would all be like, yeah, okay, I've got it. And that's what Jesus was doing, teaching us what we need to know. And so what does that mean for us? That's always the question. Everywhere is practice ground. I pray before, as I'm preparing the sermon, I pray for your, your individual circumstances. I wonder what your week's been like. I pray for where God's going to take you this week. But in all of that, all of it, he is literally doing something. We are not the same people we were six months ago or a year ago. And this week, indeed, maybe you'll be called on to do something completely different than you ever have. Maybe, or probably harder, you'll have to do that same hard thing again in your life. But nevertheless, by practicing, by being ready for it, that's how we live into the training, to the training of the dream team that we're supposed to be. And so God says to us, you've been healed, and you're still a rough draft, a work in progress, but there's a lot of work to do out there. Put the badge on, be deputized, go out, go out and do it. Scripture says, be who you were made to be. Do what you were made to do. And then indeed, God will have all the glory. Hallelujah. Amen.